Hey guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on ForgottenWeapons.com. I'm Ian McCollum, and today we're going to take a look at the M1 carbine. This is in no way actually a forgotten weapon, but I think there are some important elements of the story behind the M1 carbine that you may not be familiar with, and I think it's important to recognize and understand the carbine in the form which it was adopted in order to better understand the guns that attempted to become the M1 carbine but failed, and also to understand where this weapon went through its development cycle after World War II. So uh, just to put it in a little bit of context, the M1 carbine did not exist prior to 1941. Uh, and by the end of 1945, more than six million of them had been manufactured. That is the most uh, production of any American uh, military firearm during World War II. We made more of these than M1 Garand rifles, believe it or not. So uh, there had been requests from the military for a light rifle. Um, they showed up in 1938, although I believe there were some sporadic requests before that. 1938 they were pretty serious, like we'd really like to have a light carbine, a light rifle, something in this sort of general form factor. And they were ignored by the military, the Ordnance Department, because, well, there just wasn't really any money to put into wacky new projects like this. Well, by 1940 the military was still asking for this, and they got a much better reception, because the world got to see the German attacks into various parts of Europe, uh, what we call today Blitzkrieg. And what they saw there was kind of like holy cow, it's really easily possible for enemy troops to break through the lines, and then all of a sudden you've got guys who are in administrative and staff roles and drivers and basically people armed with 1911 pistols who might actually be facing enemy infantry. And when they went back and looked at some of the, the captured German uh, like field hospital reports from World War I, they came to the conclusion that basically nobody was ever able to effectively uh, shoot a German with an M1911 pistol, except perhaps Sergeant York. Uh, basically what they found was there were so few casualty reports involving the 1911 that either it was never getting used or it wasn't getting used very effectively. And truth be told, a 1911 pistol is a weapon with a range of an effective range of about 25 meters, unless you're really skilled with it, which most guys aren't. Uh, especially when you start to uh, radically and rapidly enlarge the army through volunteers and conscription to fight a new world war. You don't have the time to train people to become expert pistol shots, and these are all people who have much more important roles to be doing anyway. So the idea was, let's adopt a carbine that will fill the role of the pistol, but it's something that you can shoot much more effectively to a much longer range with a lot less training. Even a modicum of training, you can be pretty effective with an M1 carbine out to 100 yards or more. That is the original intended role of the carbine. It was to arm people who would otherwise be armed with pistols. So drivers, uh, in some cases headquarters and administrative staff, uh, sometimes medical staff, uh, artillery units in particular, guys who had other primary weapons like mortars or later in the war bazookas. You know, bazooka teams would be armed with M1 carbines. Uh, paratroopers would eventually adopt a version of the M1 carbine as well. It was intended to be basically a replacement for the pistol. Uh, during the war, both the Army and the Marine Corps at various points actually suggested using it to replace the submachine gun entirely as well, although that was never acted on. But that was the purpose. Um, We'll touch on how the M1 carbine kind of, its reputation has been sullied a bit by people trying to use it as a substitute for the M1, uh, or later the M14 rifle, and that didn't work out so well. But uh, let's get back to how this was originally developed. So 1940, the military asks for this sort of weapon, and they get taken a lot more seriously. There's money involved that can be spent on this now, like people care. Alright, so let's get back to how this was actually manufactured. Uh, in 1940, the Ordnance Department starts taking this request for a light rifle a lot more seriously. There's budget in the there, there's space in the military budget now to do this. So they set out a, a set of requirements and they ask for proposals for rifles from various manufacturers and individuals and inventors. They want these guns in hand no later than February 1st, 1941. And the requirements are basically it has to weigh no more than five pounds, it has to be effective out to 300 yards, and it needs to be carried by a sling. And they're looking for a semi-automatic rifle. So they get nine major submissions, and they actually delay the tests until May because they have to get ammunition. I should point out the cartridge for this uh, this new weapon was something that they actually worked on in parallel with Winchester. They went to Winchester for help in, in the winter of 1940. Like, 
we kind of want an intermediate middle ground kind of cartridge. And Winchester looked at it and said, what you should do is base something on our Winchester, our 32 Winchester self-loading cartridge, which Winchester had used in their 1905 rifles. And it's, well, it's about the same size and style as the M1 carbine uh, cartridge, the 30 carbine cartridge that they ended up developing. That's why. They basically took 32 Winchester self-loader, they necked it down or shrunk it down to be 30 caliber, in parallel with the M1 Garand, that simplifies some tooling requirements and ammunition making requirements. It's not quite a perfectly straight walled case, but it doesn't have a shoulder. Uh, it's kind of an overgrown pistol uh, cartridge. It fires a 110 grain round nose jacketed bullet at an optimal and ideal velocity of 2000 feet per second. So it really is a middle ground kind of cartridge. There are some people who are going to denigrate it as being really wimpy. On the other hand, it's got as much energy at 100 yards as like a 357 Magnum does at the muzzle. It's, it's not a wimpy cartridge, although it is in no way comparable to 30-06. So uh, with this cartridge in mind and with its basic rifle requirements, the Ordnance Department sends out a request for guns. They get nine proposals back. Uh, the, the ammunition manufacturing takes a little longer than planned. They end up delaying the tests until May of 1941. And we'll cut through a lot of the chase. I've actually got some videos on some of these prototype submission rifles. Um, nobody wins the trials. Uh, some of the guns are better than others, but nothing satisfactory. Now Winchester, who would ultimately design this rifle, wasn't involved in the first trial at all. Winchester had just recently taken on a contract to start manufacturing the M1 Garand. They were involved in a bunch of other stuff, and they looked at this thing and they said, like, we, we just don't have the capacity, the, the time and labor and expertise. We're busy doing too many other things, we can't, we can't take part in this. However, one of the things that Winchester was working on was a rifle to compete with the M1 Garand. It was an action that had originally been designed by Jonathan Browning, half-brother bro half of John Moses Browning, and Winchester had picked it up and they were working on this, and they'd been working on it for a couple of years. The Marine Corps was actually sort of legitimately considering it. Um, at this point in 1941, Winchester was referring to it as their M2 30 caliber rifle, and it looked a lot like an M1 Garand. Not exactly the same, but similar. And one of the distinguishing features of it is it had a little short stroke gas tappet system, which was the patented invention of a guy named uh, Carbine Williams. Well, he would become uh, known as Carbine Williams, David Marshall Williams. Uh, there's a lot of lore surrounding David Marshall Williams about how he invented the M1 Carbine in 13 days, and that's basically 85% bunk. In reality, Carbine Williams was in fact an ex-con. Uh, he had been in jail for killing a guy in the process of some bootlegging and running from cops. He got out of jail, got a job with Winchester, and turned out to be a pretty darn talented gun designer. Uh, he was he initially got his job because he had developed a way to adapt the 1919 machine gun to fire rimfire, 22 rimfire cartridges for training. Uh, also did some work on adapting the 1911 to 22 rimfire. Winchester saw that work and they're like, yeah, you know, this guy kind of knows what he's doing, let's bring him on board. And the project they gave him was taking Jonathan Browning's rifle and making it actually work. And he did this by replacing the gas system with his designed little gas tappet system. By the way, I also have a video on the Winchester M2. There is one surviving example. Well, in 1941, uh, one of the Winchester employees, uh, Edwin Pugsley, had this rifle, and, and their goal was to make a very lightweight 30 6 They had this seven and a half pound 30 6 rifle, and he happens to show it to Rene Studler, who's chief of ordnance. And Stuhler basically looks at this and says, we're not getting rid of the M1 Garand, so just forget it. But we've got this light rifle thing, and that gun, if you can make it 7.5 pounds and 30-06, that's a perfect gun to scale down, make it in this new cartridge, and submit it to our trials. Because the first round of trials was inconclusive, there's going to be a second round, you should totally submit that because it looks great. And at this point, Winchester had like two weeks before the due date for these trials. They had to come up with something if they were going to do it. Now, the legend is Carbine Williams like goes off and invents the M1 Carbine by himself. The reality is he'd been working on, on the mechanical systems behind the M2 for many years. What Winchester did was take that, scale it down. Carbine Williams' initial response was basically, that ain't going to work, and if you go ahead and try it without me, I'm not taking responsibility for it. Like, you're crazy to even try that. It's not going to work. I, like, leave me completely out of this. I don't want my name attached to it because it's going to be a dismal failure. Well, 
Winchester's employees, and we'll get into the details of some of this in a later video because there's some awesome stories in here, but Winchester's employees turn out a one-of-a-kind prototype. Um, so they've got the cartridge already designated that they need to use, they don't have time to develop a new magazine or a new trigger system or anything like that, so they just take basically the whole trigger and magazine housing off of a Winchester 1907, Winchester self-loader, throw that in there, they've got a single stack magazine. It's not really what was called for, but it's good enough for a two-week you know, proof-of-concept gun. And they give it to, uh, they, they go out to test fire it for army ordnance, and it goes through just about a thousand rounds, it's like 960 rounds with three malfunctions. Wow! That's fantastic! Uh, and this is August of 1941, the trials are going to be in the middle of September. So Winchester now has about a month to take this one-off rifle, turn it into something that's actually suitable for a full-fledged endurance and you know uh, mud testing, rain testing, sand testing, the works. Uh, uh, an actual real government uh, prototype trial. Competitive trial, by the way. Uh, and Again, we'll get into some of the stories behind this in a, a later video, but the short version is they pull it off. They managed to make one gun, which is the prototype of the M1 carbine. They don't even have blueprints at this point. They just make one, hand fit it, it works, send it off to the trials. They literally get it into Aberdeen Proving Grounds on the last, like the evening of the last day to make the cut. And lo and behold, they end up winning the trials. Long story, we'll cut it a little bit short. This video is getting quite long already. From there, now the problem is production. Winchester doesn't have the industrial capacity to produce as many M1 carbines as the military thinks it's going to need. The initial estimate, by the way, is half a million of them. They would of course end up making 12 times that many. So right from the beginning it's kind of a well-known thing that there are going to be other contractors manufacturing the rifle. So there are a couple months of, of debating and bureaucratic stuff you know, the paperwork side, but right from the beginning it was clear that the Inland Company, which was a division of GM, interestingly uh, Inland grew out of the factory building that originally built the Wright Brothers airplane, but they're going to be one of the main contractors. Uh, back earlier in the tests when it didn't look like Winchester was actually going to be the winner, Inland had already been given a contract to make a thousand of the guns either developed by themselves with George Hyde or the gun developed by John Guerin, who also entered a prototype into this competition. They already had a contract to, to start building those and to get production up as a subcontractor. So it was pretty clear when Winchester won that Inland would also be building Winchester guns. And in fact, Inland and Winchester employees and engineers were meeting and going over the design even before Winchester had been formally announced as the winner of the program. Uh, Inland would go on to be one of the well, to be the biggest subcontractor for the gun, making just over two million of them during the course of the war, but there were going there would be six or eight other subcontractors as well. So Winchester made it, Inland made it, and then a bunch of other companies also got contracts. So that's probably enough introduction about the M1 carbine. Let's take a look at this one and I can show you some of the features of the carbine as it was originally designed, because it would go through a number of revisions. Winchester managed to actually basically meet the requirements, which is kind of a little bit unusual for a gun like this. The M1 carbine unloaded comes in at just over 5 pounds, like 5.2 pounds, uh, which is remarkably close to the goal weight of 5. And what they have is an exceptionally light and handy carbine, and it was extremely popular with a lot of troops, largely for that reason. Now the action looks a lot like an M1 Garand action because of the similarities based on the Winchester M2 rifle, which used the same sort of rotating bolt system as the M1 Garand. Um, and that's where a lot of the similarity originally comes from. This was outfitted with a 15 round standard uh, magazine. The original uh, trials requirements asked for 5, 10, 20, and 50 round magazines. What they ended up standardizing on was 15. Uh, these magazines are kind of one of the weak points of the gun in general. They are not particularly durable magazines, they're kind of, they weren't deliberately intended to be disposable, but they kind of are. Um, and so one of the things that troops who were using M1 carbines during the war did was just regularly replace magazines just to be safe. As the gun was originally adopted and manufactured through the beginning of World War II, the controls involved a push-button safety. So this is the fire position, that's the safe position. Uh, you also had a push-button magazine release. The magazine itself actually has two magazine catches on the back, 
and those two catches are held up by this mag release. So when you push it over, those two catches open up and the magazine can drop out. The original design used a two position flip sight, so it had settings for 100 meters here and 300 meters, with a slightly smaller aperture for longer range precision fire. Uh, not windage adjustable except by sliding the entire sight in its dovetail. And then the front sight is a single block unit, so there is no adjustment of the front sight at all. You will find manufacturer's markings on two places on these guns. One of them is on the back of the receiver. This particular one, it's a bit worn there, but it is Standard Products, which is abbreviated STDPRO. They're one of the smaller manufacturers. Um, this has a serial number in the very low 2 million range. Every one of the contractors received its own block or blocks of serial numbers to use. So the M1 carbine itself has a single serial number range, and the different manufacturers occur at different points in that range. Now we also have a marking here on the front of the receiver, and that's the same across all M1 carbines. It just says US Carbine Cal 30 M1. And then we have a marking on the front of the barrel, on the top there, uh, indicating who made the barrel and when. So the flaming bomb there is a US Ordnance Approval mark. This particular barrel was made by Underwood, who supplied most of the barrels for standard products, uh, and this one was made in August of 1943. I think it's interesting and useful to point out the M1, that the M1 carbine was absolutely the product of a true manufacturing system. This wasn't a situation where every factory simply manufactured all the parts and built M1 carbines. There's a tremendous amount of use of subcontractors for these guns. So uh, for example, Standard Products only actually made four parts. They made receivers, they made bolts, they made trigger housings, and they made operating slides. Every other part, so virtually all of the small parts plus the barrels, were made by various subcontractors who supplied multiple different manufacturers. And it's that sort of industrial outsourcing and logistical capacity that made it possible to make six million of these guns in just a couple of years time, while also producing everything else for the war effort. Now there are a lot of other parts that did change over the course of M1 carbine production. So a few of those include the front barrel band. This is the first type, which is narrow, it got wider, and then later on one of the more substantial changes was the addition of a bayonet lug. The upper handguard changed form a bit. The early ones had a narrower sight groove in the middle, and just uh, one set of rivets back here to hold on the little metal tab uh, that reinforces it. That was increased to four rivets, and the sight groove widened later on. This has the later what's called a pot belly stock. It's a thicker, heavier duty stock. The safety lever would be changed to a rotary safety so that it didn't get mixed up with the push button magazine release. Uh, the rear sight would change to an adjustable rear sight. There was actually two versions of that. There was an early forged or milled rear sight, and then there was a later simplified stamped rear sight as well. Um, contours on the operating slide would change. The bolt uh, later in production they would stop cutting the bolt of the top of the bolt flat and leave it just fully round. Uh, just to simplify and economize on production. There are a lot of these little changes, and I don't, I, I don't have the time or the ability to go into all of them today. This is more of an overview of the M1 carbine as it was used in World War II. Now, by the way, the reason that we have this kind of unusual configuration to the stock here is that there was an oil bottle that went in this slot that actually acted as basically the rear sling swivel. So the sling looped around the oiler, the oiler pulled into this slot, which holds it in here, and then the sling comes out through this slot and attaches to this sling swivel at the front of the gun. Now to disassemble this we're actually going to start by loosening the sling swivel and pulling the barrel band off. In addition to being tightened this is also held in place by a little spring clamp here. Right. We can pull that off. That allows us to remove the upper handguard, you can see the metal reinforcement here with the later four rivet pattern to it. Now it looks like you have to remove the screw back here. You actually do not. This is a metal inset plate that holds the action in place. All we actually have to do is lift up. This hook is what holds the action into this lug in the stock. So that screw can stay right where it is. So with the stock removed we can see the actual operating parts here. 
pardon this one, it's still kind of grungy, it does need a more thorough cleaning, but this is a really simple gun to take apart. So uh, we can actually start by pushing out this little pin right here. With this pin out, we can then lift the whole fire control group out, so it's hammer fired. This is all a single integral component, and that's really cool. We then have a bolt, an operating slide, and a recoil spring. And this I can just pull out. There is a tube on the side of here, and some production actually used a separate detachable tube. Uh, one of the issues during production was being able to deep hole drill this tube without it coming out the side of the receiver. Anyway, uh, we have a guide rod in there. That little guy is the recoil spring for this. And now you can actually see uh, David Marshall Williams' little gas tappet system here. So that little piston, when you fire, is going to move just a few millimeters backward, and it's normally housed right inside there. That piston is going to hit this slide, give it a pop backwards, and while the piston, the tappet itself, doesn't keep moving, it provides enough energy to this to cycle all the way back, uh, compress the recoil spring, and eject the empty cartridge. At this point, uh, disassembly is relatively similar to an M1 Garand. You can bring the slide to right here, and it lifts off. We can then rotate the bolt out. I'm not really doing this in the most efficient way, but come on you. There we go. Rotate the bolt and pull it out of the gun. There's our firing pin, plunger extractor, or plunger ejector, big ol' extractor on the side of the bolt. Just like the M1, by the way, this has two locking lugs, one of them here, and one of them this big one that also acts as the cam surface for the, uh, the operating slide to open and close the bolt. And then we have a little cutout right here that allows the operating slide to be just lifted right off the side of the gun. You can see uh, the imprint right in there, where the gas tappet actually hits this. Um, and uh, this, is, this is obviously one of the main fundamentally important uh, components. And there is your stripped receiver and barrel and gas block. So uh, it really is a, a simple, uh, it's a small gun compared to most because it is, it does use that diminutive, relatively diminutive cartridge. And uh, really a very interesting gun to look at from both a tactical perspective and a manufacturing perspective. After World War II, of course, the carbine would go on to kind of grow in scope and scale. Uh, late in the war they introduced the M2 carbine, which was a fully automatic version. They introduced a 30 round magazine to complement the full auto capability. They would introduce uh, the carbine with the M3 infrared scope. That also came actually late in World War II. Uh, that would be used in the Korean War. The M1 carbine in general would see substantial use in the Korean War too much use really. By the time of the Korean War there were a lot of guys who were kind of trying to make this into a standard rifle. Um, it, it doesn't really fill that role well. This is a fantastic, extremely capable, accurate, and, and you know great firepower sort of weapon when you compare it to a pistol. It's anemic and underpowered and short-ranged and fragile when you compare it to an M1 rifle. So therein lies where we see different opinions about the, the utility and the quality of the M1 carbine. Uh, there was a lot of, so the M1 carbine wasn't really available to the general public until the 1960s, because these were military weapons, and until, until they were actually released as surplus in substantial numbers, the only ones that were really floating around the private market were, you know, maybe a few that had been sold off in various ways here and there, and guns that had been kind of smuggled back as souvenirs after World War II or after Korea. In the 1960s the US government released a substantial quantity, hundreds of thousands of these, uh, to the civilian market through the civilian marksmanship program. Now most of those guns had gone through a series of arsenal retrofits and upgrades and refurbs before they were ever released. So most of the guns on the market have been updated with things like new safeties, new sights, and that makes the early configuration guns like this one, which is mostly early configuration, um, particularly desirable to collectors. And in my mind this is a particularly interesting 
the most interesting version of the carbine because it reflects how the carbine was originally manufactured and how it was what the, the form that it took during most of its actual use in World War II. So this particular one uh, came to me courtesy of Interordnance or Royal Tiger Imports. They brought in a whole mess of interesting guns from Ethiopia and it included a lot of M1 carbines that were provided to Ethiopia as military aid before going through any of these arsenal retrofits in the United States. So they have some early guns, they have some late guns, they have some mixes, and they have guns from all sorts of different manufacturers uh, who were involved in production. So uh, it's a really cool opportunity, especially if you're interested in getting an early configuration gun like this one, because they have a bunch of those because of the weird alternative path that these guns took into Ethiopia and then back here into the US only very recently. So check out uh, Royal Tiger Imports if you're interested in picking one of these up yourself. As I said, they have a wide variety of, of uh, quality ratings, manufacturers, early, late, you name it. You can check out their website and see all the details. Uh, otherwise, I will uh, leave you with some links at the end here to some of the other guns that were involved in the M1 carbine story, like Jonathan Browning's Winchester M2 rifle, that's a really cool one that they have at the Cody Firearms Museum. And now this gives us a good basis to talk about some of the other aspects of the M1 carbine, where it went, and some of the stories behind it. Thanks for watching.